Wonderful. Well, good morning, everyone, or good evening, wherever you might be. Thank you so much for joining. Um, looks like we have hundreds of folks joining today, which I'm really excited by. This is a topic that I'm uh, very you know, interested in personally, which is using the Postgres planner to debug bad plans and speed up queries. I'm Lucas, I'm the founder of PG Analyze. You can also find me on Twitter or on Mastodon. And today we're gonna to talk about essentially how to understand the Postgres planner and how to make use of the planner to debug your plans and make your queries faster. We'll talk about a few things today, but before I jump in, I want to point out that we also have Manuel um, from our team on the call. Manuel is going to paste a few links into the chat um, that are matching to the things we're talking about. Also, if you have questions, you can um, share them at the end um, or paste them now in the Q&A and we'll get to them at the end. Um, I'll answer one question really quick, which just came up, which is whether the webinar is going to be recorded. Yes, this is being recorded um, and we will actually share the recording afterwards as well. Um, we'll also share the slides. Um, so we'll receive an email tomorrow with the full details. Um, I've heard from many of you that your colleagues might not be able to join. Um, so please feel free to join this after the fact as well. Now today we're going to talk about a lot of things and I want to make sure that you know we we kind of get to everything. So we'll go rather fast, um, but do please ask if you have any clarification questions later. Now we'll start by talking about how we go from a query to a query plan in Postgres and how the Postgres planner works. We'll then talk about how the Postgres planner uses cost estimation and selectivity to come up with its plans and what the components are that influence that. Then we'll talk about scan and join planning, which is one of the core planner functionalities that we rely on. We'll talk, then talk about two special cases, parameterized index scans and bounded sorts, both of which often show up in plans that I've personally worked with and that will help you speed up your queries when you find them or when you see that they are not used when you want them used. And then we'll switch gears and we'll talk a little bit about how we can track bad plans with auto explain. We'll also show PG Analyze and how PG Analyze can help you do this, but you don't need to use PG Analyze necessarily. It's just a convenient way to do this work. Then we'll talk about explain analyze buffers and how you kind of interpret that output. And then at the end, we'll talk about how you can either pin plans with PG hint plan or Aurora's query plan management if you're using Amazon Aurora. And then last, we'll talk about how to guide the planner to the right plan. And this is really you know, building up to that where, to me, we need to understand the planner first to then be able to either you know, pin a plan or guide the planner um, without understanding you can't really you know, kind of optimize the Postgres query well. Now let's dive in. So when we go from query to a query plan, really the main motivation why I often come to this is either a query is slow or a query, our whole database is spending too much IO time or CPU time. And Oftentimes what I would do is I would go from IO, for example, into the individual queries that are running. I would then either sort this by percentage of IO or percentage of all runtime. This is a screenshot of PG Analyze, but the concept is universal, right? Like you want to go from the high level metric to the individual um, kind of aspects of the system. Now, where explain and query plans come in is that they essentially help us understand what each query is actually doing, right? So the query text, um, is kind of what we tell the database to do, but then what the database actually does is represented in the case of queries um, by the query plan. Now, in PG Analyze, for example, what we do is we also visualize this. And we talk a little bit more about that later of how we make use of auto explain to show you these plans automatically. Now, I do want to take a step back here actually and kind of think about, you know, what are the things that we can change and, you know, where do these queries even come from, right? Um, so oftentimes, you know, you have an application developer deciding what the actual query intent is, right? It's like what they're trying to get from database. Then either the developer or an ORM, which oftentimes, you know, is, is in place here, um, decides the ex exact query text. From this query text, we then go to Postgres and Postgres decides at planning time which plan to use. And last, Postgres will execute your query. Now, what's important to note is who or when you can change these things or what to do to change them. So when you want to change the query intent, that's really the most expensive thing to change, right? Because you have to change either your data model or your application logic. And so this is probably the thing where there's most inertia to actually make a change. Now, the query text, um, if you, you know, have actual text in your application, you could probably just change the query text um, and for that, for example, get a different plan. Um, sometimes also, and this is also changing the query text, but sometimes it helps to just add more um, filters to the query, which we'll talk about later as well. And then 
you can, you know, when you want to influence the plan, there's various things that Postgres considers when it comes with a plan. For example, you can improve the statistics that Postgres uses, you can change settings, or you can run, analyze, or vacuum on your database, which oftentimes helps. Um, you can also use planner hints, which we'll also talk about later. So today, really, we're going to talk about these, you know, two last aspects, um, a little bit of, of the former as well, but really our main goal today is with the same query text, um, what can we do so that Postgres picks a better plan? Now, I think it's always important to understand, you know, the systems you're working with, and Postgres Planner is somewhat complicated, but also, in a sense, simple. So this is a good um, presentation from Tom Lane um, quite a while ago, like 12 years ago by now, um, where he talked about hacking the query planner at PGCon in 2011. And he essentially stated that the planner's task is fuzzy, right? There's many valid plans for the same query, and it's not always clear which one is best. Now, this is true for you as an observer of the planning process, but it's also true for the planner itself. So sometimes the planner makes decisions where it has to, you know, not find the perfect plan, essentially. And at the high level, this is also from Tom's presentation back then, the planner's responsibilities are finding a good query plan, don't spend too much time or memory finding it, and support the extensible aspects of Postgres, right? So it's important to remember that for example, PostGIS, right, has all kinds of different operators. And so the whole planning process has to support these extensibility aspects and can't really, you know, kind of make optimizations that maybe some other simpler systems can do. Now, this is, these are my notes, which is, you know, what does the planner not do, right? So the planner does not find all possible query plans. It discards seemingly worse plans pretty quickly in order to reduce the memory consumption. It also doesn't change a plan when expectations don't hold true. Right, so you might essentially, you know, think that the planner sees that, you know, thought that matched ten rows, but actually it matched a thousand rows, and you know, maybe at row hundred it should realize that, um, but unfortunately it doesn't. Right, so it's it's kind of uh, simple in that sense, and it also doesn't have a sense of time. So the Postgres planner doesn't, you know, keep track of what the execution performance was for the query last time. Um, it will happily keep producing a bad plan um, without, you know, fixing it itself. Now there's four phases of planning as described by Tom back then. First of all, we have early pre-processing. So early pre-processing is essentially where the planner transforms a query in a way that is usually the same, right? So this doesn't necessarily produce that many different plans. Um, it's more that um, it simplifies your plan. So for example, oftentimes uh, there's a concept called sub-query pull-up, where if you, even though you have sub-select, Postgres will actually choose to move that sub-select into a you know, upper portion of the query to then be able to do joins, you know, at one level instead of doing it in a subplan. And so these things happen really early um, before a lot of the other work. Now, scan join planning is really one of the core functionalities. And this is where a lot of the variab variability in different plans for the same query exists. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. And then special query features, these are things like aggregates and other things that are not considered just scan or joins. Um, and post-processing really are topics for another time. Oftentimes they're more interesting if you're hacking a Postgres itself, but to you as a user, especially the post-processing step is probably not that interesting. Now let's talk about one of the core aspects of what the planner does, and this leads up to scan and join planning. So the planner, um, you know, ultimately is driven by what's called cost estimation. So if the planner, you know, generates a plan, but it rejects it, then, you know, like you essentially it knows that there is a good plan somewhere, it just didn't end up choosing it then really what you need to fix is the cost estimation. And so the way that Tom describes this is saying, you know, garbage in, garbage out applies here. So the idea is that if you have a bad cost estimation, you'll get a bad plan in many cases. Oh, and I'll actually answer a question really quick since I didn't get to that earlier. Um, presentation is going to be about 45 minutes. Um, so we're probably about, you know, let's say 10 minutes in now, so another 45 minutes, um, and then we'll get to the Q&A at the end. Now, on a startup cost here, this is one of the things that Postgres does to come up with, you know, these cost estimates. So startup cost is the effort of getting the first row from a particular node in the planning process. This is where Postgres kind of, you know, like always gets for each of your index scans, for example, it knows what does it take to get one index entry. Now, next, it looks at the total cost. The total cost, this is really when you think of a cost-based estimation, right, and like the planner optimizing for cost, um, it is looking at the reducing the total cost of your queries. 
the row count, this is, um, and I actually had to take a step back here and remember this. So the row count is not the rows that the index scan here looked at necessarily, is the number of outputs from the index scan, right? So this matters most if you have joins and then you kind of use that result in other parts of the query, um, or you have an index scan that's used in the join, then this output row count um, estimate really matters a lot. And then last, we got the average row width. This is used, um, again, an estimation of planner makes um, for estimating um, kind of the workspace for sorts or hashes, right? Because it has to know how many bytes um, to allocate. Um, again, these are estimates, right? So this is what the planner uses to understand how extensive each portion um, of the plan tree is. But when we talk about cost, what is cost really, right? Like I've, I've oftentimes wanted this myself. And so really, you know, one way I could put this is cost is not a specific unit, it's more a currency um, that the planner operates in, right? So it matter, what matters most is essentially that the planner has certain logic that gives a certain cost number, and then there's other logic that, you know, also gives a cost number, and then the planner compares the two. Oftentimes it's a simple, you know, which one is bigger. Um, and so that is, you know, the, the thing to know about cost is not necessarily the number of IOs or number of CPUs. Now, what is the cost of a sequential scan, right? That's maybe the simplest example. So here I'd like to jump into the Postgres source code for a moment um, because I, I actually find this quite readable. Um, you have to skim over a few things, but the thing to know is that when Postgres looks at, you know, should I use a sequential scan? It will actually cost the sequential scan. So it will look at your relation, your table, and it will say how many pages are on this table, right? How many eight kilobyte pages does this table consist of? And then we'll multiply that by the sequential page cost, which is a setting in Postgres. Um, oftentimes, you know, you tested the one essentially. Um, so in the simplest case, the um, you know the disk cost, which is the majority of a sequential scan, is just going to be the number of pages in your table. And then Postgres just returns that, right? And this is essentially the cost of the sequential scan. Um, here at the end, you can also see the startup cost versus the total cost, right? So again, the startup cost is just get a, the cost of getting one row in this case, and the total cost is going to be getting all the rows in this table. Now, more interestingly, though, what is the cost of an index scan, right? So when Postgres, for example, opts to not use an index, why does it not do that? And so here it really helps to, again, dive into the actual planning process and look at um, how you know, Postgres kind of does this. Um, now, the first step to understand is that Postgres does this based on an access method specific um, handling logic. Um, so access methods are things like B-tree, GIST, GIN, Brent, right? So index types um, commonly known. And so the idea is that Postgres um, has a function for each of those index types. And so for example, for the B-tree index type, you have this BT cost estimate function. And this is a simplified version of this, but I think it, it helps to maybe briefly try to understand what it does, right? So in the very beginning, it talks here about when it does a B-tree scan, only leading equality columns or equality comparisons plus some inequality comparisons um, are used to determine the index selectivity, meaning where in the how much of the index it has to scan, right? And so again, this is a cost estimation. But what that means is if you're using any fancy operators or you're you know, ordering operators in the wrong way, then that will greatly influence the index costs. Now, that is then passed down and um, you apply the partial index predicates if it's a partial index. Um, so that kind of you know, adjusts which portion again of the index you're looking at. And then ultimately what we calculate is the B-tree selectivity. So selectivity here is a number between zero and one. And you can see that um, towards the end, it calculates how many index tuples, how many index rows, essentially, um, it has to look at based on the total number of index entries in the index multiplied by that selectivity, right? And so it really comes down to, you know, what is that number? Right? And so again, to, talk, to quote Tom here, um, selectivity is the hard part, right? So ultimately, when you see Postgres making a certain cost estimation, um, you will find that oftentimes selectivity is the root cause of a bad or a good plan. Um, and so it just helps to remember that, you know, that is being determined for each index, right? For each um, kind of set of expressions that you're um, trying to use an index with. Now, again, we can look into details of how the plan does this. So when we look at um, this clause list selectivity function, right? That we, um, here you can see the B-tree selectivity is essentially the clause list selectivity um, and it's, it's passing in the, the different walls, the different expressions essentially um, that you're use, trying to use here. And so it's, um, you know, in the simplest example, 
um, essentially computates uh, computes the um, a list of expression clauses, right? This might be something like A equals one, B equals two, C equals three, right? So that's being passed into this. And then Postgres tries to understand, you know, how much of the, the relation, the table or the index that, that was being passed in has to be scanned or that matches essentially those, um, those clauses. And we'll get back to this a little bit later, but the important thing to understand here, and I actually find the source code pretty readable here, is that generally Postgres tries to apply what's called extended statistics first. So if you have extended statistics or also known as create statistics, um, that essentially overrides a lot of this clauseless selectivity handling um, that Postgres does here. However, if you do not have that, then Postgres estimates it by taking the product of the selectivities of each individual clause, right? So A equals one would be a clause, B equals two would be the other clause. And so this can cause a lot of issues. So um, ultimately selectivity determines how many rows are, you know, um, either to be scanned in the index, but then also how many rows are being returned from each point node, right? And so, for example, if you have a sequential scan and you have a filter, then Postgres will also determine the selectivity of that filter to then know how many rows are roughly going to be returned um, by the sequential scan. Now, you know, this oftentimes, you know, actually causes you problems, and usually it causes problems because individual clauses are not independent. So what that means, if you have an A equals one, and B equals one, and C equals one, and D equals one, and E equals one, right? Um, the ones are just examples here, but essentially the question is, you know, what if all the A's, A equals one rows also have B equals one, or no C equals one row also, you know, has a D equals one, so actually no rows would match, right? And so this information is not known to the planner by default. And so really this is one of the big problems is if you have these kind of dependencies, these relationships between um, the different kind of values in your, in your table, and you're querying by multiple clauses, then estimates can be wrong. Now, there is a simple fix nowadays in Postgres, which is called create statistics. I'm sure many of you who are here today have used this before, but really, you know, it bears repetition, especially if you haven't, is that if you have situations like this where you have complex where clauses, um, for example, then create statistics helps Postgres understand the relationship between those columns um, and through that provide a better selectivity estimate. Now, there is a whole other complication here around join estimates. So up until now, we talked about individual scans on indexes or tables. Now it gets a whole lot more complicated when we're talking about a join, right? And Postgres also has to estimate joins because it has to know, here in this case, right, we have two sequential scans that are being joined together for a nested loop. And that then has a certain number of output rows that will drive other aspects, right? It will drive the cost of some other plan nodes. It will drive the behavior of, you know, maybe there's another nested loop and then it has to loop over this many rows. And so Postgres has logic for each of these types of joins. So here, for example, you know, if this is a simple equality join, um, there's the function EQ join select inner, um, and that's just gonna, or join selectivity inner, and it's just gonna combine, you know, kind of selectivities in a certain way with certain formulas. Um, this gets complicated really fast. Um, so we want have time to dive into the details of this today. But one thing I want to point out to you, which is, you know, when I looked at this myself in the source, which stood out is that um, Postgres has this concept of most common value lists. So when, um, you know, Postgres wants to analyze on a table, it will find, you know, how frequent are certain values in the table. And so these most common value lists are used for certain things, but they're also used here, where it essentially tries to say, well, if we're joining, right, and we're matching up the rows of these two tables, if we're matching up the most common values, we actually have a sense for, you know, how likely is it that there are matches between those two tables. And so most common value lists, um, you can control um, by increasing the statistics target. So Postgres has this concept of statistics targets, which is how many rows are essentially, how many sample values are kept by analyze. And so you can increase that, the default would be 100. Um, if you increase that to, let's say 500, then suddenly you had a lot more most common values. Um, and so that way the join selectivity um, in some cases can be improved. Now, if you're wondering how can I actually, you know, find out if this is a problem. Now, if you're looking at an explain plan, you can literally just, um, and you do an explain analyze, you can literally just look at the, the numbers for each row, right? So here we can see rows equals one, but the actual rows is actually, you know, 1,600. Um, 
if you're using PG Analyze, we actually highlight this to you as an explained insight. So when you um, kind of look at an explained plan in PG Analyze, you'll see this misestimate um, tag um, and this, you know, kind of insider annotation or tag um, tells you that, you know, there was this misestimate, right? Postgres thought it would be one row, but it actually was 1,600 rows. And, you know, this is not just, you know, academic. This actually happens a lot in practice. Um, I just found the next best plan as I was preparing those slides. Um, and I looked at, you know, just this example of misestimate, right? So here you can see there's two nested loops. The inner nested loop kind of has, you know, takes an aggregate, takes an index-only scan. Both of these two, you know, actually have correct estimates roughly, right? The aggregate is slightly off. Um, but then what happens is the nested loop on top of it was estimated to have one row, but actually got 1,600 rows. And then what happened is that there was another nested loop on top of it, um, and that nested loop, you know, expected to execute the inner portion one time, but it actually executed 1,600 times. Um, and so that, you know, suddenly was a lot more expensive. All right, um, let's talk about scan join planning. So this is, again, a bit special wording because, you know, the planner uses special words in places where regular words, you know, might suffice. Um, but so um, Tom defines this as the aim of the planner is producing a join rel containing all base rels of a query. Now, when we say join rel, what we mean is essentially a, a data structure in the planner that says join this table with this other table. And when we say base rel, really what we mean is individual tables, right? So base, like basic tables, essentially. And so what Postgres tries to do, right, is like it, it tries to find first the cheapest path for each pace relation. And then when we say path, it essentially means plan node, but it's a simplified structure that the planner uses. And so Postgres will go through all the base rels, all the basic tables that are referenced in your query, and it will find two things. It will find the cheapest path, and it will find the cheapest path with um, in the case of the base rel being parameterized, which is also called a parameterized index scan. And we'll keep both of these. Now, we'll come back to parameters index scans in a moment, but I want to just give you a quick example of what that means, right? So let's say we have this, this query here, we're joining three tables, and you know A, B, and C would be considered base relations here. Now, for A, you know there's no clause on it, right? Like we're just, um, in this simple example, we're just saying, give me all the A's. And so it would just literally say, well, sequential scan makes most sense, right? If the, even if there was an index, it would be more expensive to use the index. The sequential scan is going to be the best choice. Now on B, let's suppose there's an index on Bx, right? So we're filtering by B.x. Um, so an index scan is probably the best choice. And on C, um, we can pick, again, the index scan because we have that index that matches that per condition. Now, again, parameters to index scans are special, so the join conditions are intentionally omitted here. Um, but in the most basic approach, this is what the planner does first. Right. So if for some reason the planner says you had two indexes, I used, you know, this index versus the other index, really that happens pretty early um, in the planning process. And really, again, it's driven by selectivity and by cost estimates. Now, after we have those, you know, like costs or the, the cheapest paths essentially for those base relations, then we need to find a join order. And a join order. I think is a concept that was you know complicated for me previously. It's actually pretty simple, um, I feel, um, once you think about it. But the idea is that Postgres tries to find the best ordering of pairwise joins, right? So essentially a join always joins two tables or two uh, kind of lower um, scans. And so that is the hard part, right? Now, let's think about this for a moment. So we have a sequential scan on A, we have an index scan on B, and in the simplest example, right, we could do a nested loop join, um, and so we could represent that as A and B being joined. Now, if we also add a third relation to C in this case, then we get some potential differences in join order. So you can see here that there, you know, again, suppose the base rel, you know, we determined we do an index scan on C. Um, so now what Postgres could do to actually come up with a result, it could say, you know, I joined A and B together. Now let's join the result of that with C. Now, you could also represent this differently, right? So Postgres could also choose to first join A and C, and then after A and C are joined, join in B. And, you know, this both these both of these will produce valid results in this example. Um, so how does Postgres come up with, you know, the right order? So the gist of it is, is that it will, again, do a cost-based comparison. 
right? So we'll try to say which, you know, which of these showing orders produces a more optimal result, produces a more optimal cost um, at the top, essentially. Now, I like to, you know, represent showing order in the simplest example, literally as, you know, a set of relation names or A's and B's um, and parentheses, right? So the idea here is you first join A and B, then you join in C. Now, you could also do this a little bit more elaborate. And if you see people talking about this on the Postgres hackers mailing list on the Postgres performance mailing list, you might have seen something like this, where it's not just talking about joining A and B, but it's also saying it's a left join and the predicate, like the condition on those joins is, you know, a, like something that combines A and B, and then we're doing another left join on C and it uses a predicate on B and C. Um, and so this, you know, is, the full details that somebody would actually need to know if you're talking about, you know, how to optimize this and how Postgres would treat this. Um, so you, you may also see this form of join order. Now, um, joining lots of tables is, you know, expensive to analyze essentially um, because it's actually an n factorial type problem, right? So it's a lot cheaper if you have two tables, but if you have 10 tables, it's a really big number of potential join orders. And so Postgres will have heuristics to not have to do all of that. Um, but once you reach the magic number 12 by default, then Postgres will actually switch to what's called the genetic query optimizer. Now, I'll admit, I personally haven't seen the genetic query optimizer myself much because most databases I work with have less than 12 tables in a join. But I've heard anecdotal evidence from people that the genetic query optimizer oftentimes produces really bad join orders. Um, it's, you know, it's used a genetic algorithm, um, and that will not necessarily find the best join order. Um, so if you can avoid, you know, getting to that number of tables, that's probably a good thing. And so one thing I like to think of, right, is like, there's essentially three essential choices that cause a good or bad plan for the same query in Postgres. So first of all, um, which scan method was chosen, right? So is it an index scan or a sequential scan? Um, which join order was chosen between you know, different relations and also different join methods, right? Um, so we didn't talk much about this here, but um, remember there's hash joins, merge joins, and nested loop joins. Um, they have different performance characteristics. And so sometimes you actually want a nested loop versus a hash join. And I want to end on this, you know, kind of join order topic but just showing you an exploration um, that we did at PG Analyze, um, which is, um, we may or may not launch this. Um, if you're interested in this, please you know, let us know, reach out. Um, but you can actually extract join order from an explain plan, right? So if you look at an explain, it will show you just by you know, how the plan is structured, right? How the, the nested loops, for example, are structured, it will actually show you how tables were joined, which order. And so here, this is the same query, but you can actually see there's two different join orders that were used for that query. Um, and so that is something that I personally found interesting and I found helpful because what I've sometimes seen is that the wrong join order produces worse query performance, essentially. All right, let's talk about parameterized index scans. So this is a favorite topic of mine. Um, let's use a really simple example. So we're joining table one and table two, and we're joining them on the Turing condition, the T1 ID equals the T2 T1 ID, right? So very typical example. And we're also filtering T1 on a certain field. Now, you may see a plan like this, where it will do a hash join, where it combines a sequential scan on all of T2. And then it um, will um, essentially you know, also get T1 as it matches that field, and then we'll want merge them together or, or hash join them together. Um, this is, you know, an example of where I, when I was looking at this, I wanted to not have this, right? I wanted to not have the sequential scan. Now the question is, how can we get Postgres to not do a sequential scan here? So one way of putting this or of looking at this problem is that when Postgres chooses to restrict or filter a, a scan, right? So it, like, it looks at a particular table, how can it know that it doesn't have to look at the whole table? So first of all, simplest example is you have a fixed condition like where and not delete to that, right? In that case, you know, Postgres definitely knows and can, can pretty much always, you know, decide to, for example, use an index. Um, although Boolean indexes are usually not a good choice, maybe a partial index, right? So if you had a partial index, that will be used. Now, second case, 
is where you have the parameter value or a constant value being passed from the client, right? So this may be different for different kind of customers of yours, um, but you might have something where user ID equals a certain value. Again, this could, um, you know, it's very simple. Postgres can use an index. Now, the third case, and this is what we're seeing here, is that you're filtering on the table, right? But you're actually filtering it based on another table's output. So we had our T2, um, like T1 ID. Um, another example might be you have an orgs table and you want to filter all the organizations um, based on, you know, your user's table organization ID. And so in this last case, this is really where you want to have if you want that index to be used, um, you need to use a parameterized index scan or you need the planner to produce the parameterized index scan. Now, if we get the good plan here, right, the one we want, um, what we would expect is it's always going to be a nested loop. And then the T2 in this case, right, the one where we want to see this parameterized index scan, that's going to show up as the second relation. It's also called the inner relation. Um, and so the idea is that the nested loop first gets all the T1 values. And then for each of those T1 values, it will essentially go in and it will run one index scan for each output um, with you know, that T1 ID being substituted. And another way of thinking of this, right, is like, if you look at it visually, in one case, you've got a hash join. Um, in another case, you get the nested loop join. And really it's that, you know, the, the join type difference um, kind of lets you, um, lets you use that index scan. Now, remember, parameters index scans only happen when there is this inner side of nested loop. Um, that means join order influences this a lot, right? So if you have things being joined in the wrong way, um, then you will not see an index used in those situations. Now, another special case um, are bounded sorts. Now, what do I mean by bounded sort? Let's imagine we're Lumen Industries and we have hundreds, thousands of employees, uh, allegedly. Um, and so we are, you know, um, essentially trying to get the most recent user um, that joined the company. Now, in this example, right, we're selecting from table users, we're filtering by company, and then we're ordering by the most recent created update, and then we're limiting by one. There is two ways that Postgres can implement this. It depends a bit on which index you have. So if you have an index that's just on users and company, what Postgres will have to do is it will have to first find all the rows that match, right? So 100,000 rows in this case. And then it will have to sort those rows in memory or on disk um, by the created app date. And then it will get the top row, right? Um, obviously, that's going to take time. Now, the alternative is that Postgres can do this. So Postgres can, um, if you have an index on company and create that in this case, um, you can actually, you know, have Postgres directly just get one row from the index. And this is an amazing performance difference, right? It's like, again, looking at 100,000 rows versus looking at just one row. And this only works in B-tree indexes. And the reason it works is because B-tree indexes are sorted. And so Postgres in this particular case, right, if, it, if you have that order um, condition in the index, will only have to find the leftmost or rightmost index entry um, to find the result for that or to buy limit one. This is, if you can do it, this will get you amazing performance improvements. Um, and really what you're trying to do, right, is like you're trying to do this bounded sort, like this order by limit. Um, you're trying to move that into the index lookup. And you do that by creating the right indexes and keeping your sort simple. Now there's also a special case of bounded sorts gone wrong. I've unfortunately also seen this oftentimes. And again, the bounded sort is kind of this order by limit one kind of statement here, right? But um, what happens is, so you have a filter clause A equals one, um, and then you have this order by B. And so Postgres Planner thinks that it will actually be better to first, like let's suppose you have an index on A and an index on B. And so the Postgres Planner will actually choose to use the index on B. And essentially it will think that it's easier to just get one row from B and it underestimates the fact that there might be a long time until you actually get to A equals one. Um, and so you get a really bad performing plan because of that choice of index usage on B versus A. Now, um, this you know, is not just me. Um, Robert Haas many years ago um, stated that this particular query, like this type of query, um, is his arch nemesis um, because he's just seen this so often in production databases. Um, and, you know, really it's, you know, it's just horrible because you get really bad performance if you're unlucky. Now, unfortunately, for those of you using Ruby and Rails in particular, Rails loves to do this as well. Um, 
I just ran this on, on an actual Rails application earlier. Um, and you know, you, if you do like you find a user, for example, and you just get the first match, um, Rails will happily add an order by ID um, automatically, which unfortunately to Postgres sometimes means that Postgres goes and uses your primary key index when really you would want the email index to be used in this case. Now, if you're running into this problem, the way to work around is by doing a multi-column index. Um, sometimes also extended statistics can help, but this is a, a good fast fix. It's just making it attractive to Postgres to use this index because it fulfills both the order by um, and default column. All right. Well, looks like we might actually take slightly longer than 45 minutes. Um, now that we talked about how the planner works, um, we'll spend probably another, let's say, 15 minutes on talking about how, you know, how to make use of this information, right? Because again, we want to emphasize with how the planner functions to then get better plans. And also, thank you everyone for posting Q&A. Um, we'll get to those at the end. Um, and then if there's too many questions, um, we'll also make sure to follow up um, on the questions we couldn't get to. Um, so please um, continue to post your questions um, on the portions that are upcoming as we go through them, and then we'll go back to them at the end. Now, let's talk about tracking bad plans with auto-explain. So this is a topic that's dear to heart um, because we actually do a lot of this at PG Analytics. So the problem and why we care about auto-explain and you know um, doing anything that automatically collects plans is because if you run an explain analyze at this very moment and your query was slow yesterday, then it could be that you're observing a very different state of the system essentially so you might be getting different execution times right because if you do an explain analyze right now you might actually get you know data in cache versus it wasn't in cache yesterday um you might also get a different plan altogether if you're postgres you know kind of ran analyze on the table um overnight and so it becomes um quite challenging to really understand what happened in a slow query um when you debug things after the fact and so auto explain is an amazing extension um, that you know exists in Postgres. Um, I've seen many people use it. Um, I use it myself um, on basically any production database I use. Um, and auto explain will help us track outlier plans and log them to the Postgres log. Now, simplest example looks like this, right? So you just have a log line that says this query took like this long, and then there's a query text that's in the, in the log. Um, I actually recommend using the JSON format because it's slightly easier to parse. Um, and then also, um, like one important detail is to set lock timing to off. So when you run it in production, which I would recommend you do, do turn lock timing off because that is the one thing in um, auto explain that's unfortunately um, sometimes has performance overhead. Um, and so the timing, you know, kind of uh, has a, especially around nested loops, um, has some overhead. Um, and so that's why turning the timing off will remove that overhead um, and let you run auto explain with the log analyze option on, which is really important because it gives you runtime statistics, um, not just the theoretical plan. Now, I did actually, um, because I think timing is so important, it's just unfortunate that it's expensive. Um, I did actually work on a patch uh, that tries to fix this. Um, so this uh, tries to you know kind of take the idea from sampling based profilers and tries to apply that to the timing option. Um, and so this is a patch I worked on um, earlier this year, um, definitely not Postgres 16 material, but might get into Postgres 17 um, if you know we continue to work on it. But the idea is that you know you don't actually need perfect timing information. Um, and so with this uh, patch in place, it might actually be feasible to have timing information in auto explain as well um, in a production system on by default. So. Just something to mention, um, but again, if you're using auto explain today, um, this would be my recommended configuration. Um, this is also what we recommend when you install PG Analyze. We'll tell you to you know kind of set these settings. Now, how do I actually make use of this auto explain output? Right. So I have these you know plans in my logs. Now, there's two ways that you could make use of it. Um, you could use the Postgres query ID to link the data and kind of summarize it, or you could use PG Analyze for it. I'll briefly describe to you the kind of the open source uh, quick way to do it um, and how PG Analyze, you know, does that better. It makes it more convenient. So the simplest way to do this is when you're in Postgres 14 or newer, um, Postgres has what's called a query ID. It's essentially a 64-bit integer that identifies the you know, query text. And so as of Postgres 14, this also shows up in the logline prefix and PGSet activity and PGSet statements were kind of originated from. Now, when we want to track auto-explained logs for particular queries, right? We want to say 
give me the slow examples for this query, what we can do is we can add the query ID to our log line prefix. We can then um, find a slow query using pgstat statements, and then we can grab our log files for you know the log lines that match that query ID. So that's one way to essentially get you know all the slow queries, uh, all the slow plans for a query. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, now let's say we have PG Analyze in place. Um, how does PG Analyze do that differently? So what PG Analyze does is um, essentially independent of the query ID. Um, the reason we don't use the query ID directly is mostly because we are interested in a more stable identifier. And so what we do is we, in the PG Analyze collector, which is kind of you know our um, component that runs in your infrastructure, we take the PG Stat statements data, we take the auto explain data, we take the query texts that are showing up in those. And then we'll calculate what we call the query fingerprint. Now, query fingerprint essentially takes the parse tree and comes up with a 64-bit integer as well. But the big benefit is that it's more stable, essentially, than Postgres query ID. And that's then being used to link things together in PG Analyze. Now, how this looks in practice is that PG Analyze has a list of queries, right? This is all the kind of queries that run in your database. Then if you go to an individual query here, you'll see the query fingerprint on top. This essentially is, again, from the query text. But then because we have this query fingerprint, we can actually link the explain plans directly to the query. Um, and so you can see all the slow executions of this query directly in the PGLens UI. Um, and then we can also get the individual plans. Right? And again, I want to highlight that this is the exact plan that happened at that time. Right? So here, for example, this, um, I think, you know, shows you yesterday. Um, it shows you a slow plan um, at 1.50 in the morning. Um, and so it shows you that that particular plan um, took 3.5 seconds, right? This query on average takes 3.5 milliseconds, but the slow invocation was actually a thousand times slower. Um, so very interesting. Why was it a thousand times slower? We can go in, we can see the exact plan node that was slow. Um, so in this case, you can actually see a nested loop that was executing that index can 5,000 times um, when Postgres thought it would only execute once. So very clear, you know, example of um, the explain plan actually helping you find the root cause um, of the slow query. Now, both in auto explain and in regular explain, we have the concept of explain analyze buffers. So explain analyze um, by default does not give you this information. By default, explain without analyze will not give you any useful actual statistics, which just gives you the plan. Um, explain with analyze gives you the plan chosen and the actual runtime statistics, um, like how many rows did the plan return and such. Um, and then with explain analyze buffers, you also get IO statistics. When we say buffers, um, what we mean is an eight kilobyte buffer page, right? So it's the same as like a shared buffers in Postgres. Um, you have these buffer pages, which are kind of the, the structure that the Postgres planner, um, the Postgres system kind of works in. Now, this is from a great post that Nikolai um, from Postgres AI team um, worked on a while ago. But Nikolai pointed out that you really should be using buffers. Um, and so I just you know, shamelessly stole his example here because I think it's a great example that he used. Um, so in the top example, you can see that he essentially had a query that was fast, right? That took 0 0.1 milliseconds. And so it was 0 0.4 milliseconds. Um, and that query only hit 11 buffer pages. Then what he did is he ran a big delete in this table. And so he produced a lot of dead rows, a lot of bloat. And so then in the second example, he gets the same number of output rows, um, but it's actually 50,000 you know, kind of pages times eight kilobytes, so a lot more. And the query takes you know, 340 uh, milliseconds. So I think this is a good example of where you can actually see that the dead rows and bloat greatly will influence it um, and explain analyze buffers, you know, kind of that that helps you kind of pinpoint that. Now, one thing I want to mention to you, if you're using the buffers option in explain analyze, be careful when you look at hit counts. Um, so the last example actually had a hit count um, that was not a nested loop, but here is an example of a nested loop. And so you can see here you have a sequential scan, you have the index scan. And the index scan is being looped over 100 times. And so the shared hit counter here might say 1,200. This does not mean that you actually you know, had to load 1,200 buffers um, or that there is a plan even that would you know, theoretically have to load that much because um, the shared um, hit counter counts each access. And so if you're accessing the same portion of the index in this case, again, it will count up one, even though you already have the page, right? It's already in memory. And so unfortunately, this does not mean distinct. It just means the total hits. Um, and so just be careful um, if you're looking at 
rested loops. Now we're kind of getting towards the end here. I think there's two more things that I want to mention. The first is how you can pin a plan, and the second is going to be how you can guide the planner. Now, pinning plans is kind of the you know brute force method here. Um, we can use one of two methods. So generally speaking, why would you care about pinning plans? So sometimes your data looks you know a certain way, and then you start changing your data, right? You change, start changing the stuff you're inserting or updating. And the new rows look a bit different. Now, today you might actually, you know, have this like oddly shaped kind of data, right? So sometimes you hit one, sometimes you hit the other. Um, and so what Postgres will do is, you know, when you have a particular query invocation, it will choose either the one query plan or it will choose the other query plan um, based on selectivity and cost estimates. Now, that is an estimate, right? Those are statistical, you know, assumptions. And so Postgres will get it wrong sometimes. And so what if we actually want Postgres to use one or the other consistently? So one option that we can use is PG hint plan. So PG hint plan is an extension to Postgres, similar to auto explain. Now PG hint plan you can enable exists on the cloud providers as well. So you can use this in RDS and the other ones. Um, and so you can just enable this on your database. What PG hint plan lets us do is it lets us tell Postgres how to essentially perform a certain operation to query. Let's imagine, you know, the good query plan here was doing a hash join. So I can use this special annotation here in the beginning and I can say, please Postgres do a hash join in order to implement this query. The alternative here is using a hint table. The hint table kind of looks like this. So it essentially says for this query string here, um, please, you know, use this hint, right? So if um, I'm doing a select star, please do a sequential scan. Um, if I'm doing in the second example here, I'm doing a select ID in this query, then use an index scan. You're just matching out in a query text um, with the special kind of matching of um, the, the question mark here at the end, you can see where does t1.id equals question mark. That means that it's kind of substituting that for different IDs. So this works, you can create these hints on your database. Um, to be honest, I find it a bit tedious to maintain, so I don't actually use this much in production, um, but I'll get back to another use case of PG hint plan in a moment. Now, we also have Aurora Query Plan Management if we are on Aurora. Now, Aurora Query Plan Management is a little bit inspired by what Oracle, I think, offers in Oracle Enterprise Manager. Um, and I think it's intriguing, but it's also a little bit complicated. Um, and it's, you know, something that I have not seen used in production a lot, um, even though I think it's, it's pretty neat in a sense. So what um, Aurora Query Plan Management does is essentially it has this concept of approved plans and it will kind of let you, you know, decide if an unapproved plan shows up, right? So one that you hadn't seen before, what should happen, right? And should Postgres be allowed to use it or should it only, you know, kind of use the approved plan? And so it does that, that matching based on um, both the SQL hash and it kind of has this concept of a plan hash. Now the SQL hash is one of the important things to understand. It's pretty much the same as a PG hint plan does with a query text, it's just hash instead of a text. And so Aurora you know, has this logic of going from a query text that shows up in your application, kind of you know, what you're sending Postgres um, to kind of this SQL hash to kind of simplifies your query. Um, notably, for example, it doesn't remove all comments. Um, so if you have you know, special um, comments in the middle of your query that might actually break um, your SQL hash generation. And so this was uh, one of the posts that I've seen on um, kind of actual using Aurora Career Plan Management in production, um, which was a great post by Chris Keel, um, where he kind of you know, described the motivations of why, why it's useful, um, again, to kind of get specific plans um, consistently. But really one of the challenges he saw is that the exact same statement kind of produced different hashes, um, depending on what arguments the client was passing. Um, and so that kind of made it oftentimes not work at all in their particular example. Now, I would say, you know, um, both PG Hint Plan and Aurora Career Plan Management are useful, but they, they always deal with whole plans, right? So they kind of, they do per query adjustments and, you know, in case of PG Hint Plans, a lot of manual work. Aurora Career Plan Management is likely less manual work because you can try to understand your system a little bit automatically, but it's it's a very coarse mechanism. Like it's, it doesn't really fix the root cause of bad plans in Postgres. And so really what we want to do if we can, you know, um, like get better plans as we want to, you know, kind of guide the planner. Um, and so this is the last um, the last section here. I know we're a little bit over time already, but um, really what we want to do is we want to guide the planner to the right plan. So 
First of all, you know, when I look at a bad plan, um, I want to understand why the bad plan was chosen. And I, I start doing that by forcing a good plan. So I mean by forcing a good plan is let's <clears throat> let's say we're searching, you know, for object D1 to three. We, you know, send it to the planner, we get the good plan. And then theoretically, there, you know, there's a good plan of the total cost of 250. Theoretically, there's also the bad plan of cost 300, right? Um, but we're kind of happy with that result. Now we have another object ID where you know we pass in four, five, six, and then the planner, because of selectivity estimates, produces the bad plan, right? And so theoretically, in this example, there's also the good plan, right? It was one of the options that the planner had available, but it did opt to choose the bad plan um, again because the cost looked more interesting to it, right? Um, and really, what oftentimes happens in these situations is that the cost estimates are wrong. And so, for example, in this case, you know, you could see before for the good query, right? The cost was 250. Now for the bad query with the bad plan, um, the cost was 500 for the good plan, right? So what we're trying to do is how can we get to this, you know, the number here, right? So we're really trying to understand is Postgres trying to, you know, kind of making the good plan too expensive essentially. And so the first thing I like to do um, is to just turn off planner features. Um, that's really easy. You can do it in any Postgres. Um, so these are connection local. And so for example, let's say you're getting a sequential scan when you want an index scan. Um, and for example, you know, we know that the sequential scan is cost 300 because we, we see that from the explain, um, but we want to understand how expensive the index scan was that was rejected. And so we can literally just say, set the enable sequential scan off. And then what Postgres does behind the scenes is just makes them really expensive. Um, I think that's probably a trillion um, in cost units. And so then Postgres will say, well, clearly, you know, this index scan is cheaper, so I'll give you the index scan. Um, and so that way you will get the plan that wasn't considered um, through kind of, you know, turning this off temporarily. Now, don't actually turn it off permanently, right? This is just for debugging. Now, once we have the right plan, once we know, you know, kind of the, the shape of how the good, the, the good plan looks like, um, then we can, you know, kind of look at the individual plan nodes and try to understand where Postgres misestimated, right? Because oftentimes, you know, in more complex plans, you'll have to dig a little bit and you'll have to understand, you know, which which original plan node kind of got you the bad estimate. Now, this also applies um, to, to joins, right? So for example, I've oftentimes seen a hash or a merge join being used, but actually what I wanted to see is a nested loop and parameterized index, parameterized index scan. Um, and so I would just go and turn off merge join, turn off hash join, and then Postgres has to do a nested loop. Um, and so that will get me the costs um, for the parameterized index scan. Now, I want to give you one last example today, which is one thing that I've run into myself recently, and I just found it useful to go a little bit more in advance than the planner features, which is you can use PG hint plan to force the good plan, right? So if you're trying to debug why Postgres chose a bad plan, you can use PG hint plan not to pin the plan necessarily, but just to debug it. So this is an example with memoize in Postgres. Um, I don't, if you're in Postgres 14, you probably saw memoize in your plans. Um, I think it's an interesting feature, but I've also seen interesting planner choices um, be made because of it. So this is an example where Postgres um, chose a certain bad plan. And really what's bad about this plan is it picked an index only scan, but it, in, it scanned the whole index. So instead of you know just finding one index row, it actually scanned the whole index. Um, and then it used the result of that, um, passed it to a memoize kind of plan node and, and did an index scan on their table. And so that, you know, was not the plan I wanted. This performed badly. Um, and so I wanted to understand, you know, how can I get that, the better plan? And so the reason that Postgres kind of, you know, did this here is the join order, right? So it just essentially chose to join schema columns stats with schema tables in that order. Now, the good plan is the other order. So it's schema tables first and then schema columns stats, right? Again, nested loop, right? So one happens first. And so in a good case, I first have an index scan um, on, on the one side, and then I can use the results of that um, to do the index only scan on the other side. Now, I got this plan first by turning memoize off in this example, um, but that didn't actually tell me how, you know, like why memoize was doing what it was doing. And so I actually ended up writing a PG hint plan, hint, and this gets a bit complicated, but essentially um, at the very top here, you can see I tried to tell it the join order. So this is with the leading kind of hint in, in PG hint plan. And then in addition to a join order, I also actually had to force the particular indexes that I wanted to, to see. Um, and so I told it, you know, index only scan, index scan, and then also force memoize off. 
And this got me essentially to the bad plan, but it got me the bad plan without memoirs. And so really what happened here in this particular example is the good plan had a cost of 1.4 million. The bad plan without memoirs has a cost of 14 million, but the bad plan with memoirs um, had a cost of 970,000, right? And so Postgres kind of picked the bad plan um, purely because of the presence of that memoirs node. And that you know, memoirs essentially um, makes plans cheaper, um, plan notes cheaper. Um, and there's a reason why it does that, but in this case, it was bad um, estimation on memoirs as part. And so what I ended up doing actually is I ended up making um, a pretty um, drastic change here. Um, I'll get to that in a second, but um, overall, just high level summary, right? Um, when we wanna guide the planner, there's a couple of things we can do. So if it's simple scan selectivity problems, look into create statistics. If it's joint selectivity problems, look at increasing statistics targets. Generally speaking, also review your cost settings. So random page cost in particular is oftentimes set too high in Postgres. Um, so that's something that you might want to lower and that will drive you know, the choice in Postgres between index scans and sequential scans or certain types of indexes. Fourth, creating multi-column indexes sometimes helps, right? So if you have this bound sort example that we looked at, um, multi-column index will help. And then fifth, if you have really complex queries with surprising joint orders, make it easier for Postgres, maybe break the planning problem down by using materialization um, or just you know, consider rewriting your queries. And then last, um, if you have a multi-tenant application, you may actually want to add additional clauses. So Postgres, you know, has to use parameterized index scans because you're asking it to do so. Um, and so sometimes it actually helps to add more where clauses because you might have tables that, you know, have duplicate kind of uh, columns. So this is what I ended up doing in this memoized case um, a little bit, you know, I think a month ago or so ago, um, I essentially just did a PR that fixed this particular bad query and the way it fixed it is just by adding a filter on an extra column. And that way we just went away from this nested loop. We essentially ended up with a hash join um, instead. Um, and that was the, the way to fix that performance issue. So in conclusion, if you want to use planner hints, go ahead. There are ways to do that in Postgres, but really I would recommend looking at better statistics, looking at other ways to you know, kind of improve the Postgres planner's understanding um, of how your query works. And with that, um, thank you so much for joining today. Looks like we ended up taking a lot of time, but I'll, you know, answer questions for another 10 minutes or so. Um, looks like we have quite a good number of questions. Um, and then if you have more questions, please feel free to post them. Um, we'll follow up with questions um, afterwards as well that we didn't get to. Um, we'll include them in the, the email tomorrow. Um, and again, we'll send out the recording as well as the slide deck. Um, so thank you everyone for joining. I'll take a quick sip of water and then we'll go through questions. All right. Um, let's see. So um, I'll go from the top and we'll see where we get. Um, so this was in the beginning. Um, David asked a question, is there a way to see the rewritten query? So I think this is probably in reference to Postgres, you know, kind of having this early planning step where it, you know, says, you know, simplifies the query. And so, yes, there is a way to show, you know, see not the query text necessarily, but you can actually, there's some debug settings that you can enable and then Postgres will actually output the, you know, plan tree as it kind of passes through different stages. So there is a way to kind of see that version um, of the query if you want that. Um, let's see. All right, so Krishna asks, um, if you alter query um, and you run explain analyze again, um, and then caching hits in, kicks in, right? When you, cause you run the explain analyze um, multiple times and then the query is faster now, but then later the query might still be bad, right? So essentially like the caching behavior made the query seem fast and explain analyze, but then it actually got worse later. So I think this is really where, I think two things. So first of all, explain analyze. If you, if you run it yourself, always run it multiple times um, because it, it shows you the caching behavior and it shows the performance um, when things are in cache. Now, how to know the performance when it's not in cache um, either look at the buffer hit counters or buffer, well, buffer hit or read counters if you have them, um, knowing those caveats around nested loops, but it gives you a sense of how much data the, the plan is working with, right? Um, so more buffers means if uh, there are IO constraints and things are not in cache, then things might be slow. If you want to know the actual kind of, you know, um, performance, then this is where auto explain really helps because it gives you that, that bad cache, you know, the cold cache performance. Um, Matthew asks, uh, should or can statistics be completely generated as a table matures? Um, I think this is actually a very good question. So one of the challenges with, you know, table statistics is that they change over time. 
So Postgres has an auto analyze function, which is part of auto vacuum. And Postgres will reanalyze your table, but it will always look at a subset of your table. Um, so it will not look at the whole table. It will just you know scan a certain set of, of pages, and then it will come up with these you know hundred examples or thousand examples, depending on the statistics target. And so yes, Postgres will completely regenerate those statistics. And that can be a problem. It can also be good. Um, but this is one of the challenges that you see when plants fall over is an analyze that happened you know, behind the scenes and that caused statistics to change. So something to be aware of. And you can also run analyze yourself to get more control of that. Um, let's see. All right, so uh, Andre, I think, uh, had, had more of a comment, but I think it's actually a good example. Um, so Andre commented they had an issue with GEQO, like the genetic query optimizers, and they actually had to find the right order of joins to get a good execution plan. Um, so I think it's just a, an example of, you know, how the genetic query optimizer can definitely produce bad join orders. Um, and so again, you know, this might actually be where something like PGM plan could help you, right? Because you could force a certain join order, um, or you could rewrite your query to be a simpler um, kind of planning problem so that the planner knows what to do. So I think it's a good, good example, again, of the, this magic, you know, number of 12 joins um, being a problem. Um, let's see. There was a question on indexes, which I think is, is good. We, we actually did a, a full webinar on indexes a um, couple, couple months ago um, last year. Um, but um, there was a question from Pratik on, does the order of columns matter in a multi-column index? And um, the, the order does matter. Um, so we talked about, you know, that selectivity estimation function and kind of the costing function for indexes. Um, and really what that tries to model is, you know, the actual execution expense essentially around um, around, you know, how long does it take to scan the index for a particular set of columns? Um, and uh, it will matter greatly, like if, if your first column essentially um, you know, kind of an index um, is repeated a lot, for example, in OPOSC search, that was a problem. Um, and then also if, you know, not all of your queries use the columns. Um, so it's a, a complex matter, but the column order does matter um, because it kind of defines the physical structure of the B-tree. Um, and Pratik also asked the related question, which was around um, include clauses. So indexes have this uh, special include clause, which they really help around um, the result of an index um, scan, right? So if you are if you have an index scan and you then want the result of this index scan to be used, for example, in a parameterized index scan with another relation, um, then the include clause will help you to you know, get more answers from the index, um, also it's called a covering index. Um, again, this is probably a you know a bigger conversation, but um, just index design really matters a lot for what the planner has as a you know kind of starting point. Um, let's see. All right, um, I'm going to skip over a few since I want to make sure that I get to, uh, since a few folks asked a few questions, which I think is great, we'll get to those questions um, asynchronously. I'll just make sure to answer a few other folks um, live as well. Um, let's see. So there was a question um, by Ilya um, whether it's possible to set the log min duration statement for one particular session. Um, you should be able to. So my understanding is um, the same actually applies to auto explain. So you technically can overwrite the auto explain threshold um, as, as well as the log min duration um, for individual sessions. Um, now, the hard part might be that you, you do this interactively, right? So you have to actually be in that session to issue that command. So it works great for debugging, right? So if you want auto explain to output an explain plan, you can just, you know, change it in the session and then the log will output auto explain data. Um, but um, yeah, if, if you have an existing kind of process, it gets a bit more complicated. Um, but generally, these settings are all you know changeable on a per connection basis. All right, let's see. So I think Missy had a good question on um, work. Uh, so she's been working on speeding up and reducing costs on a query that is using an inefficient index to create an, an appropriate index, but a query is still using the inefficient index. Right, so the right index is in place, um, but you know it's not actually using it. Um, and I think this really comes back to that, you know, kind of debugging technique I showed at the end, where we're trying to kind of know the costs of the plan we want Postgres to use. Right, so if um, like maybe just to really quickly show this example, oh, let's see. Now I stopped screen sharing. That was not intentional. Give me just a second. <laughs> um, so if we go back to this here, and then 
you can see here in this PG hint plan example at the top, right, where we're essentially telling it to do a particular index scan in a particular like index only scan even. So you can force the planner to do that. And so when you have the situation where you created an index, but Postgres isn't using it, then what I would recommend is actually going, um, you know, going to PG hint plan and saying, it, you know, give me the costs of the plan with that index being used. And what you will probably find is that, you know, the cost is higher. And so then it, you know, will come down to understanding, okay, so why is it higher? Why would Postgres think it's more expensive? Um, for example, if you have a very complex index um, or large index, right, on this, Postgres might choose to not use it because of that, you know, physical relation size, for example. Um, and so that, you know, like getting the actual query plan with the costs will help you understand that. All right, um, and I think I'll get to one more question and then the rest will do asynchronously. Um, let me just see if there's... Yes, I think this is also a good, uh, a good question here. Um, so um, Israel had a question on how can we plan for the worst case scenarios? So, um, for example, you know, regarding the sequential scan plan and the good statistics, but then, you know, it's working fast, but then there's this 1% query parameter, like a certain parameter that leads to disastrous performance, right? Um, so how can we get Postgres to, you know, we, we actually are okay to kind of use the worst average performance, but, you know, to avoid the tail average, like the tail latency being less, right? So we kind of don't want it to switch around the plans. And, I think, unfortunately, the answer is in core Postgres, the best way to do this is to understand why Postgres is choosing that 1% case, right? Um, so what I would do is I would lock the plans of auto explain like the outliers, understand the statistic, statistical choices behind it. Um, and then like kind of as we, you know, kind of went through different techniques here, right? But we um, use one of these techniques to essentially make that bad plan less expensive right uh, or sorry more expensive <laughs> like or the good plan less expensive um so really like in core postgres the choices you have are really around influencing planner costs right now what you could do if you're on aurora this is actually what aurora query plan management tries to achieve um is to you know kind of catch this one percent case um again in practice i think there's a lot of details to making it work well um but you could use query plan management in aurora to kind of avoid those those one percent cases um, and if you try it out, um, let me know how you how you um, find it. Um, one of the things that we've been looking at at PG Analyze is actually how can we integrate PG Analyze more with either PG Hand Plan or Career Plan Management. Um, so if you have use cases where you want to, you know, kind of capture these worst case scenarios better um, and maybe automatically make choices, um, that is something that we have in our roadmap for PG Analyze as well. Um, and I'd be happy to talk more about that um, separately. All right, and with that, um, the rest of the questions we'll take um, offline and we'll kind of send them out in the email. Um, I'll make sure to, you know, kind of uh, get you a good answer on, on each of them or at least tell you if we don't have a good answer. Um, and then you also get a quick survey at the very end here. Um, please let us know what you liked about today's webinar or what you didn't like. Um, we're looking forward to see you at the next webinar. And thank you so much for joining today.